this short video, I'm going to have a play with a diplexer. So what's a diplexer? Well, the first thing to say is that it's not a duplexer. A duplexer is a component that separates two signals to perhaps a shared antenna or from a shared source, whereas a diplexer is a special kind of bandpass filter that installs immediately after the receive mixer. And its purpose is to make sure that the receive mixer's IF port sees a smooth, even 50 ohm termination across both the desired frequency, the IF, and all other frequencies. A popular form of diplexer is called the bridged T diplexer, and it looks like this. It's simply a series tune circuit and a parallel tune circuit to ground with 250 ohm resistors to either port. The series and the parallel tune circuits need to be resonated at the intermediate frequency. And there are some really useful calculators, several of them online that allow you to enter your intermediate frequency the impedance at either end and an overall Q factor and it will calculate the values for you. Here's the bridged T diplexer redrawn. So it connects to the output or the IF port of a diode ring or double balanced mixer. So how does it work? The series tune circuit is resonant at the intermediate frequency. So in my case, the IF is a slightly unconventional 4 MHz. So at 4 MHz, the series tune circuit presents a very low impedance to the IF signal, whereas the parallel tune circuit represents a very high impedance. This tune circuit here at 4 MHz at the intermediate frequency is as good as a short. So there's a very low impedance path from the output of the mixer through to the input of the first IF amplifier. But now if you think about frequencies away from the IF, so let's take twice the IF, let's take say eight megahertz. Now the series tune circuit will exhibit a high impedance. In fact, consider it as almost being open circuit. The parallel tune circuit will represent a low impedance to ground. So consider that to be almost a short circuit. So the IF, port will see 50 ohms to ground for frequencies other than the IF through that 50 ohm resistor on the left. Now the nice property about this symmetrical bridged T diplexer is that this resistor on the right presents a 50 ohm load, non-reactive load, to the input of the following stage at all frequencies other than the intermediate frequency. Pretty simple. When you use the calculator, you need to provide a Q, and the Q is suggested to be between 2 to 4 and 10. 2 to 4 for VHF, and as high as you can get it to 10 for, um, for HF. When you put a Q of 10 in, you get some really odd values. So at 4 megahertz, the bridged T diplexer needs 20 microhenries and in series with 82 picofarad. That's a big inductor in series with a small capacitor. And down here in the parallel tune circuit, 200 nanohenries in parallel with 8 nanofarads. I think the high Q option gives you a much narrower diplexer. I dropped my Q to 5 and that halved the values. So the series tune circuit came down to 10 microhenries in series with 160 picofarad a little bit more manageable. And for the parallel tune circuit, 400 nanohenries in parallel with four nanofarad. These were all fairly achievable using T37 toroids. Here's the bridged T diplexer again, exactly the same circuit in EI9GQ's book. in experimental methods in RF design, there's a different, slightly simpler form of diplexer. 
it's pretty easy to see how it works. There's the series tune circuit, so very low impedance path at the intermediate frequency. There's the parallel tune circuit offering a low impedance path to a 50 ohm resistor for all other frequencies. This type of diplexer offers a 50 ohm load to the mixer or to the source on the left, but not to the sink on the right. Rather than build this right into the mixer compartment, I decided to prototype it first. This is the 10 microhenry inductor for the series tune circuit. This is the 400 nanohenry inductor for the parallel tune circuit. And you can just see the quarter watt 50 ohm resistors in there. I should note that the diplexer came up on 4.1 megahertz when first built. And so I disconnected the lower tune circuit and swept the series tune circuit, found it was high, added a bit of capacitance there to bring it down and um, just played with the turns a little bit on the lower tune circuits inductor to get it relatively close to four megahertz. It doesn't really need to be absolutely spot on. Using the trusty scalar network analyzer here, I've set up a script to sweep from 2 to 6 megahertz. So the middle of the passband here is coming up at, at 50 kilohertz high and a attenuation in the passband of 2 and a bit dB. The minus 3 dB points are a megahertz wide so it's not particularly sharp. So the diplexer is about 15 dB down at two megs and probably the same up around about six. Here's a wider sweep from one megahertz to 30 megahertz. It's showing the diplexer is centered on four megahertz and minus 2.2 dB insertion loss at that point. Now I haven't calibrated the network analyzer so there could be a dB or so of um, calibration error there. Um, even so, uh, one and a half to two dB um, is probably about what we'd expect. Down at one megahertz, we're about 20, 25 dB down. And at the VFO frequency, which is 11 megahertz, we're about 25 dB down. The harmonic of the VFO at 22 megahertz, we'd be around about 36 dB down. So. This is going to have the desired effect. So this is the RSP1A's Spectrum Analyzer software. And we're two megahertz per division. So DC down the bottom here, 20 megahertz up on the right hand extreme. The first thing to do is to work out what spike is what. So I've disconnected the RSP1A entirely. It's just sitting on the bench, nothing connected. Little spike here, not sure what that is. There's always a spike here, and I believe this may be related to an internal clock in the RSP1A. There's another spike here, I'm not quite sure what that is, that's on 10.97 or so. And over here there are another couple of spikes. So I'm just going to ignore these and attribute those to uh, random pickup or something coming out of the RSP1A itself. Remember that the RSP1A is connected to a Windows 10 computer and I can't run this software without it. So uh, those spikes may relate to clocks and noise coming out of the, um, the Shack computer. Let's have a look at the output of the post mixer amplifier. And we've got three points marked here. So in this test, the receiver, which has a 4 megahertz IF, is on the lower end of 40 meters, so 7020 kilohertz. I'm also running a signal generator that is putting a signal right on 7020. So now let's try and interpret what all of these spikes are. Well, there's a big cluster down here beneath two megahertz. 
And these are, I think, broadcast band pickup. The other possibility is that it is noise coming off my switch mode power supply. But, uh, but I have tried it off a linear supply and it really didn't make much difference. I think that's the likely explanation. Now this first big peak is at 4 megahertz. So that is the signal generator, the 7020 kilohertz signal generator coming through the um, receiver. Now I can prove that by killing that signal, which I've done, and I'm just allowing for a couple of cycles because I'm looking at a, a, a times two averaged display here on the spectrum analyzer software, so that's disappeared. Signal generator back on, and it comes back to about minus 58 dB. Now there's a couple of other spikes there as well, which are also coming back. So these are harmonic spikes related to the 7020 kilohertz signal that's coming into the front end of the receiver. Now, by far the biggest signal is this one here at 11032. Well, 11032 minus 4 is 7032, which is pretty close to 7020. That's the VFO. Now, I know that's the VFO because I'll now turn it. And as I'm turning it, the PLL is updating rapidly. Now, I've wound it up to 7252. And uh, when that spike comes back, you'll see that it's moved up the band by a couple of hundred kilohertz. I'll wind it back down to 7020. So that's back down to 7020 and it'll come right back to where the marker is sitting. So that's the VFO. So there's another spike right up here at about 15 megahertz and that disappears when I kill the signal generator, which I've just done. So that's an artifact of the 7020 kilohertz signal coming in the front end of the receiver. So that's, uh, that's a mixing product of some description. So this is what the mixer would be seeing, quite a lot of junk. Uh, that's the signal that we want. All of this stuff we'd like to lose, and we'd certainly like to lose the VFO, which, by the way, is 20 dB stronger than the signal at the IF. So... Let's now cut our diplexer in. So I'm now connecting the diplexer into circuit at the output of the post mixer amplifier. And now, now we're looking at the output of the post mixer amplifier with the diplexer in circuit. And doesn't that look better? So now the largest thing we've got is the signal coming down the IF. That's, that's the wanted signal. And we have the VFO down here at minus 65. It was at around about minus 42. So that's 20, 23, 24 dB lower. That's the spike. And that harmonic there, that harmonic or mixing product associated with the signal coming in the receiver front end is completely gone. So that's a much, much cleaner signal as a result of installing the diplexer. The final task was to take those inductors out of the prototype and mount them on a tiny daughter board inside the mixer compartment. So for me, that's the very first time I've put a spectrum analyzer on the output of a receive mixer. And it really is an absolute forest of spikes and unwanted RF energy. So it's been fun to see how a simple diplexer can clean a lot of that up and keep a double balanced mixer happy. It's not a lot of work to build a diplexer. It's very easy to resonate on the IF frequency and easy to install. So now that the double balanced mixer output port is properly terminated, what difference will it make to the performance of my receiver? So there are a number of tests that can be done to measure receiver dynamic range, overload performance and intermodulation distortion performance. That is a topic for another video and quite frankly, 
for someone who probably understands it better than I do. So I'll put some links if you're interested in the video description. Thanks for watching. See you next time.